let's uh, let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's turn to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and chapter number nine. We've got to stick with the theme of Christmas carols tonight. <coughs> Sing, we've sang three of them tonight. Let's sing another one. Isaiah chapter number 9. And verse number 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful <coughs> Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We just ask you to have your way with us tonight, Lord. I ask you to empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to each and every one of us uh, through your word tonight. I pray that this message would be encouraging to us. I pray that uh, it would be sobering to us, Lord. I pray that it would be uh, uh, just a solemn reminder uh, for us tonight, Lord, uh, of what these things mean, of where we're at in your timetable. And Lord, I, I ask these things, again, just take over now. And Lord, just, uh, your word says where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you'll be in the midst of them. Lord, we ask you to, to be in the midst of us tonight. We ask you to just take over. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> For unto us, unto us, a child is, uh, or unto us, a child is, unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You kids heard that one? Yeah. You've heard that one on the radio? Yeah. If you know that song, and Darren's embarrassed for my singing abilities, but if you know that song, then you know Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You have memorized a verse. You didn't even know it, did you? Yeah. Yeah, that's a memory verse. It's a good way to memorize it, isn't it? To sing it. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is that talking about? Jesus. How is it talking about Jesus? Is it talking about what we think of as Christmas? Yeah. You know, when we celebrate his birth? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. How? How is it talking about Jesus? For unto us a child is born and a baby. Mm -hmm. Unto us a son is given? Okay. Yeah. All right. But this is written 700 years before he's born. Whoops. You guys missed. Yes, he's a prophet. Yes. yes, he's prophesying. He's explaining what's going to happen before it even happens. I think that's pretty cool, don't you? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who could he have been talking about other than Jesus? There was no special child born during the time of Isaiah. There was nothing necessarily special about any anything that was going on there. He's talking about Jesus. He's predicting the Messiah. Because then he goes on, he says, hey, his name shall be called Wonderful. And it's capitalized. He's talking about God. This isn't just any ruler he's talking about. <laughs> his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. Oh, here we go. The Mighty God. In case we're missing it. <laughs> In case we've missed the point that he's making. He's predicting the Messiah would be born. That, he, that a son would be given to us. 
says that his government shall and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Hold on. Wait, what? We haven't even gotten out of this out of this one verse. We haven't even got halfway through the verse, and that doesn't make sense. Because that hasn't happened. The government isn't on his shoulder. The people tried to make him a king, and he refused. So what's going on here? Was Isaiah wrong? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So far there's about 2,000 years in between those two phrases. And counting. Isn't that neat to think about? Now Isaiah wasn't wrong. I was being silly there. Uh, no, he's, he's just predicting that the government will be upon this person's shoulders. It's talking about the thousand year reign of Christ, which hasn't even happened yet. And that's what's amazing about this verse. It, it's, like, it's like God was giving Isaiah, Hey, Isaiah, I want to give you a vision of the big picture. I want, I want you to step back, Isaiah. If, if he, now, he didn't literally take Isaiah into the sky and give him a vision of the planet or anything like that. God could have done that. God did do something like that with Ezekiel. You know, he took Ezekiel from Babylon and gave him a vision of the temple back in Jerusalem. So God can do things like that. I'm simply saying it's a picture like, like God taking Isaiah in his hand and taking him really up high and going, look at all this. You see all this? You see this whole planet? I'm in control of all of it. You see all this? You see all the people on this planet? I know each and every one of them. In fact, I can count every hair upon every one of their heads. I know every thought that they're having every <coughs> second of the day. What, what it tells me is where, I mean, when it goes from Jesus' birth to the fact that he is going to reign in the same verse, what that shows me, first of all tonight, that God is in control. I mean, it says... The government shall be on his shoulder. Listen, the government's in control, amen? Speaks of control. God is in control. Nothing is catching him off guard. He wrote this 700 years before Jesus was even born. Roughly 2,700 years ago. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. If he comes back this year, if he comes back next year, if he comes back pretty soon, well, that would be roughly 2,000 years from a child is born to the government being on his shoulder. That'd be roughly a 2,000 year gap in, the, in between those two phrases. Uh, it's just, it's mind blowing to think about how God is in control. I, I, I stew over things a lot of times. I, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about the state of things. I'm concerned about the hard-heartedness of people that seems to characterize this day. I'm concerned about if people are Christian or, or speak of Christ at all or name His name in their life, they seem to be pretty, you know, quite a bit looser than what you'd hope to find about someone naming the name of Christ. You know, uh, I'm not their judge. I'm not. I'm just noticing. That's all. I'm just noticing. They might name the name of Christ while they're taking a drink. You know, they might name the name of Christ while they're living in their sin. You know, I've, I've seen guys naming the name of Christ while they're shacking up with somebody. That, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, you You've got people today, and, and, it's, and it's a growing amount of people who are very hard-hearted toward the gospel, <laughs> won't hear of it, don't want to believe in God, don't want anything to do with Him. And then there are those who profess to want something to do with Him, but I, you don't see any evidence. That's very concerning. I mean, there's, And it seems like the person who's really on fire for the Lord, that, that is getting to be a pretty small group. <laughs> uh, it's getting to be a pretty, pretty small group. That concerns me. I mean, people are losing their minds today. 
just it's like it's like it's like it's like Romans talks about how God gives them over to a reprobate mind. I mean, we're we're getting there. Like if I think we're already there. I, Johnny sent me a, a, a video of some of some women that uh, were were planning on uh, having an abortion. They were laughing about it in the camera. Like they're not even feeling bad about it. They're not even going. I can't believe what I'm doing. You know, I, they're not even struggling with it. They're just going. Ha ha. Here's what I'm, and they're like in the waiting room dancing. They're filming this stuff. I'm going, you're going to answer for this. <laughs> there's, an, there's a holy God that you're going to stand before one day. <laughs> and the, the blindness and reprobate mindedness that we're getting into with people, it's very concerning. It's very concerning. Our politicians don't have a clue. Really, on either side of the aisle. I have, I have a, I have a certain way that I lean politically, but even the people that I lean toward, they're pretty weak. Need. They're, they're pretty. I don't know. They. Pretty leaky vessels. It's, it's pretty concerning. But when I read a verse like this. We're in Isaiah chapter 9 if you're just joining us. But when I read a verse like this where Isaiah is pre predicting that the Messiah will be born, and then in the same breath is predicting at least 2,000 years after that, the government will be on his shoulder. I mean, it's, it's, what I'm trying to say is it's like God's in control of this whole thing. He was in control of it 700 years before the baby was even born. He was in control of it before Isaiah wrote this. He's been in control of the whole thing, the whole time. He hasn't lost his touch. He's been in control of it since Genesis 3, when he promised to send him the Messiah in the first place. He's been in control of it even before that, even before the foundations of the earth, the Bible tells us. He's in control. I, and and I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is, why in the world do I worry? <laughs> why do I get concerned? My God is in control. What am I worried about? I mean, he, he's a God who can predict the Messiah will be born and in the same breath predict the thousand year reign of Christ. Several thousand years later. In the same breath. And it's like, what, what I'm trying to get at is, he doesn't even have to come up with a chart to put this together. <laughs> He doesn't even have to put it on a, on a, on a whiteboard and, and write it down so he remembers. He just, he knows it. it. It's already, it's as good as done. It's already happened in his mind. It's settled. There's no, there's not going to be any change in his plan. His plan is in motion. You see what I'm saying? And so that's, that's, it. that's very encouraging to me to see that God's in control. He hasn't lost control. Speaking of control, you know, another thing that kind of concerns me is the gun control. I saw where the, I think the Supreme Court shot, shot down that legislation where they were, they were going to try to take people's weapons. The reason that concerns me is, here's why. Because the Second Amendment was put into place to keep the government in check. It was not for hunting purposes. It was put in place because those guys who wrote it had just fought a war with their government. They had just fought a war with England. And so they knew it was important that people had the right to bear arms. They knew that was important. In fact, I, I was learning the other day, I was reading where, where towns, local militias, would actually raise money and buy cannons for their local towns. Brother Mark, did you know that? Idabel needs an F-15. <laughs> And uh, Idaho probably needs a, a couple, uh, uh, you know, two or three tanks. Uh, we don't even think like that anymore, do we? We've let our guard down is what I'm getting at. We've completely let our guard down. And the government, in the name of caring about people, is going to disarm them. That scares me quite a bit. Because I don't, I don't think, <laughs> that may be their intention right now, but it changes. It changes once, once you don't have them in check anymore. I was reading, Australia has already done this. I was reading where their, their crime rate has went up 
in one year. Like their, their violent crimes have gone up 10% in one year. <laughs> it's just concerning me. But you know what? With all that concern I've got, God's in control. God's still in control. I'll be alright. I don't I'm not putting my faith in guns. I'm not putting my faith in what I can do to protect myself physically. God's in control. He's got this. Here's another thing that's interesting. While I feel like the United States government is overreaching, I feel like the United States government is kind of waning. I think we're caving to China, to the Chinese Communist Party. I believe we're caving to them. Um, I don't think we're going to have any kind of backbone to keep Russia in check in the future. I think we're in big trouble. I think, I think our government is in big trouble. You know what? Jesus' government is increasing. It says in verse 7, look at this, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Jesus' government is only increasing. When Jesus came, 2,000 years ago, when he came, he came to, sit, to pay our penalty on the cross. Amen? Which is, which is meant to do what? To save our souls. There. There. Told you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> there. I told you I was going to get you. I told you. Okay. <laughs> Don't lie in church there. Okay. <laughs> I gotta get this under control. I gotta get this under control. Uh, Two thousand years ago, Jesus came pay our pay the penalty for what to to save our souls. Okay, where is his where is his kingdom right now? Where is his government? It's within every saved person. He's here. He's in here. If you're saved tonight, if you've received Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit is in here. He's your king. Okay? He's already your government. Here's the deal. That's only going to increase. This is just the beginning. This is just a taste. There's coming a day. He's literally going to come back. And he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule the earth. And I tell you, the earth, every nation of the earth is going to be thankful for that. Especially after they get a dose of the Antichrist. They're going to be really thankful for his reign. His, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. His government is only increasing. You know, I, I look at this, and I, to me, 2,000 years is a long time. It's been a long time since Jesus came. But to Jesus, it's just been a couple of days. A day is with the Lord as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years as a day. It's only been a couple of days in the sight of the Lord. I'm weary. I'm worn down. America's weary and worn down, you know. Uh, the world is weary and worn down. Jesus is just getting started. He's just getting started. Christians nowadays are weary and worn down. But his government is only increasing. It's just getting started. That's exciting, folks. Isn't it? That's encouraging, isn't it? That he's, he's in control of all this. People think they're in control, but they're not. His government is only going to increase. Oh, it, it, I know it doesn't look like his government is increasing. But looks are so deceiving. You never can judge a book by its cover, can you? His government is increasing. It's only going to get better and better. And that leads me to lastly, you know, the fact that there's <coughs> 2,000 years in between, at least 2,000 years, in between that first phrase and the next phrase, the government being upon his shoulder, reminds me that we're in the age of grace. And that's quite a sobering reminder, isn't it? This age of grace does not last forever. 
Thank you, honey. We're in the age of grace. You know, uh, Jeremiah explained uh, uh, there was going to be, uh, there was a, uh, I believe he touched on the 70 weeks prophecy. I know Daniel hits on it, but there's a 70 weeks prophecy. And the 70 weeks is, uh, okay, the weeks that it's talking about there is, uh, is, is actually seven years. It's not talking about the weeks as we would think of it, seven days. It's talking about seventy sets of, of seven years, so four hundred and ninety. And what's interesting about Daniel's prophecy is if you actually pay attention to where it starts and where it ends, it's four hundred and eighty-three years to the time of Christ. I believe to the day to the year that he was born. It's an interesting study, but it goes 483 years. Why am I saying that? Because there's seven years of history. 490 years minus 483, we're missing seven years in that prophecy. See, 69 weeks have been fulfilled. The problem is there's one week missing. You know what the one week? It's the seven-year tribulation. Hasn't happened yet. What does that mean? He's pressed the pause button on that prophecy. That's what's interesting about the time we're living in right now. We're, on, we're, in, we're living during the pause button. We're living during the age of grace. We're living during, during that time where Jesus has hit the pause button on that prophecy of the 70 weeks. It, 69 weeks have passed. And then he hit the pause button. He came, presented himself, and they crucified him. The last seven years of that prophecy is going to be the tribulation. And it's coming. That's a sobering thought. I have friends and family that I'm pretty concerned about. I say, why are you so concerned? Because we're in the age of grace. I mean, we're... It's looking like we, we're going to be getting on the ark here pretty soon. If, if, if people don't start humbling themselves to God, hearkening to God, if people don't start uh, turning to the Lord, if people don't start getting right with Jesus Christ, we're going to be building a boat. And God's going to shut the door on that boat. What happened back then, figuratively, is going to happen again. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to call us out here. Now, in one way, that, in one sense, that's great. But when I think about, about my friends and loved ones that are going to drown, it's quite sobering. Because we live in this age of grace. We live in the pause button. He's going to press play. When Jesus comes back and calls his church out of here, it's like pressing the play button. On that final seven years. <laughs> How sobering to think about. Man. A 2,000 year pause button. That's some serious power right there. God can do that. He can just suspend things. He can say, hey look, I've got seven more years of this prophecy of Daniel. But I'm going to press the pause button because I can. Man, that. I mean, doesn't that just show you that he's in control? I, I tell you, I'm shocked at people, the how people mock God and make fun of Him. We're in the age of grace. How sobering! For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called <laughs> Wonderful Counselor, <coughs> the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. With that in mind, folks, with the fact that, I mean, it's, we are right on the cusp of Jesus coming. It could be any minute. He presses play in this pause 
This period of pause is over. Folks, we need to, we need to double our efforts in, in our prayer lives. Amen? We need to, really, we, we've, got to, we've got to get serious about prayer. If, we're not, if you're not already, if you're struggling in that area, we have got to get on our knees. We've got to start praying for our families. We've got to start praying for our friends, co-workers, because this is serious. And one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to press play. And literally, some pretty much, hell is going to break loose. And it's going to be horrible. We've got to double our efforts in prayer. We've got to... Uh, Listen, we've got to hold tight to the faith. I mean, God's in control of these things. We've got to trust Him. We've got, we've, we've got to continue trusting. We've got to cleave to Him. And, and lastly, we, we need to, again, we need to redouble our efforts in prayer. We need to hold fast to the Lord in, these, in this, but how, how did I read it today? In this 11th hour. We're in the 11th hour. We've got to hold fast to the Lord in the 11th hour. But thirdly, and, and, and finally, we, we've, got to, we've got to open our mouth. We've got to witness. I know, I know people aren't real receptive, but we've, we've got to open our mouth. And we've got to insist a little bit. <laughs> we've, we can't let them shrug us off. We gotta say, hey, look, time, time is, uh, time is coming. It's drawing, drawing to a close. Okay, it, listen, right now, right now, Jesus is, he's got the invitation open. You know, after every service, we, we give an invitation and all that. And, and okay, right now, Jesus is in one big invitation. It's in one giant invitation. He's inviting people to come to him. We've got to warn them that, hey, look, that's coming to an end. That's coming to an end very fast. We've got to we've got to get back in our prayer closets. We've got to hold fast to him, and we've got to we, listen. We've got to open our mouths. We've got to witness to people. We have got to warn them about the judgment that's coming. Heavenly Father, tonight we we thank you for sending your son, uh, born in a, a manger, Lord, born in a stable, born to die, born to, to come and, and die on the cross and, and pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, that same verse tells us that the government's going to be on your shoulder. Lord, help us to recognize we're in this age of grace. Help us to recognize that we're running out of time. Lord, help us to get, to get serious about our prayer lives. Lord, help us to get, to get serious about holding fast to you and trusting you that you're still in control. And Lord, help us to get serious about our witnessing. Lord, help us to share Christ with others. Lord, open doors because we need those doors open. We need your Holy Spirit to work on people's hearts and convict them, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.